Emotions Matter. Brought to you by ema.com. That's e m a w w dot com. Your solution for emotional intelligence. Welcome to the Emotions Matter podcast. My guest is Seth Gillahan, PhD, who is a licensed psychologist and clinical assistant professor of psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Gillahan has developed a successful, specialized practice utilizing cognitive behavioral therapy in the treatment of mental conditions such as OCD, PTSD, anxiety disorders, sleep problems, and depression. Welcome, Dr. Gillahan. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, John. It's great to be with you. And, and please feel free to call me Seth. All right, then, Seth, it is. Early in your clinical training, it's clear you developed a passion for solving complex mental illness and addictions through the use of cognitive behavioral therapy. You've also developed a mindfulness based approach which focuses on a full life experience. Why don't you give our listeners a view into these different approaches and how you came to develop them? Sure. You know, I, I can't really take credit for developing any of them myself, but, uh, but you know, what I try to do is, is just present them in a way that, that people can, uh, can get the most out of them. So I, I, I guess the, the easiest way to summarize them is, is captured in this mnemonic that I have. It's the name of my blog, it's three words, very simple, think, act, be. So coincidentally, that's the, it uh, sort of follows the, the uh, order in which I learned each of these. So, so the think, that's the cognitive part of cognitive behavioral therapy. And, uh, and this is what I really focused on when I was a graduate student at Penn, um, working with, with a supervisor there for a number of years. Um, and, you know, our... Our thoughts, I mean, this is the kind of big idea in cognitive therapy, our thoughts are really closely related to our, our actions and to our feelings. And so we can often understand kind of what we're feeling or, or what we're doing based on, based on knowing what we're thinking or what we're telling ourselves. So, um, you know, most of the time, this is great, works well. You know, I'm, I'm you know, talking to you right now because of... of uh, you know, thoughts that I had about, um, you know, the invitation to be here and what our conversation might be like. And so our thoughts can guide our, our behavior. But, you know, in the, the conditions that I work with, like anxiety and depression and, and other things, our, our thoughts will tend to go in a direction that's not helpful to us. So, and, you know, unfortunately, if I'm depressed, it's, it's not going to be the case that I'm going to be thinking really good things about myself. I'm probably going to be thinking things that are really negative about myself and and in fact often aren't even true so for example you know a person with depression might might start to believe things like i'm unlovable or i can't do anything right or i'm i'm a waste of life i mean you know in the in the most extreme even believing that that this world would be better that there would be a net in, in improvement and happiness in this world if i were not in it so even leading to to thinking of suicide or actually you know killing oneself. So so the um, the approach in cognitive therapy is to to first of all just figure out what we're telling ourselves. Uh, oftentimes we don't know. We we just um, either don't notice what our thoughts are or we take for granted that they're true. We might think that this this thought I'm a loser is not it's not something i'm telling myself it's just an observation about the world that's true it's kind of like yeah the sky is blue i'm a loser these are two things that are true about the world once we've identified what the thought is then we can can take a look at what the evidence is for it and most of the time it's a lot of evidence against the types of thoughts that are driving anxiety or driving depression so that's that's uh the think part the act part i i uh, was focused on most of mostly behavioral approach in my uh, postdoctoral work when I was a faculty member at at uh, at Penn in a center specializing in the treatment of anxiety, 
And uh, so this is, you know, again, there's this this relationship between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And we can focus on the thoughts as in cognitive therapy. We can also really start with the behaviors in more of a behavioral approach. So, um, so if I'm finding, you know, a real lack of engagement in life, uh, I'm not getting a lot of enjoyment or, or pleasure or um, fulfillment day to day, then I can, can, uh, can find things I'd like to be doing more of and, and gradually add those kinds of things into my life. And um, in a, I guess, a, a similar way, but a pretty different approach, we can, we can emphasize behavior in treating a lot of fears. So if I'm afraid of, you know, a very simple example, let's say I'm afraid of dogs, then one of the most powerful ways to overcome that fear is to just gradually, systematically start to um, approach dogs until, uh, you know, I spend enough time around dogs, assuming these are relatively safe dogs, nothing, uh, nothing actually bad happens like getting attacked or bitten. Uh, then the fear is going to go down. It, it pretty much just has to as a rule of our nervous systems. So there are lots of ways we could structure our behavior in a way that, that, that helps our emotions. And the final one, and this was the, the last one that I came to, um, the B part of Think Act B is, is for me shorthand for, for mindfulness and acceptance based approaches to living. So, um, you know, we, we spend most of our lives focused either on the past or the future and we spend a lot of time struggling against things as they are, uh, wishing they were different, even if we're not able to, to change and things like the weather, you know, I'm from where I'm sitting, it's a gray cloudy day, uh, rainy out. And, um, you know, I can, I can wish and, and fight and curse the weather all I want to, it's not going to change it. All it's going to do is make me less happy with it and, and feel more bitter and resentful, uh, the weather's not what I want it to be. And so, so whatever the, the situation is, we can practice opening to it and, and being in the present as it is with acceptance. And, and this is an approach that I think, you know, it fits well with the other, the other two, with the, the cognitive and the behavioral approaches. And it's been shown in, in countless studies to be pretty effective at helping with things like stress and anxiety. So, so, you know, I, I said in the beginning, I didn't develop any of these, um, any of these treatments, but I, I think what makes this work really enjoyable and I think also really challenging is that, yeah, I don't know what's going to be helpful to any one individual. I, you know, I've got some tools and, and, you know, most likely they're going to help someone, but I don't know exactly what combination a person's going to need in advance. And that, that I, I think part of, part of what can even be a little a little terrifying about this work is that it, it has to unfold in real time. I can't spell out for someone in advance exactly what steps he or she needs to take, like a like a cookbook or something. And so there's a a sort of uh, I mean there's no net so to speak in therapy. This is this is live work that that uh, that comes through a collaboration between you know the therapist and and the person that we're working with and and that's another real fundamental of of CBT is that collaborative approach well it certainly sounds like as you mentioned that it's got to be really collaborative and getting people to a B state that says don't fret about the things you can't control in your environment worry about the things you can control I think mm -hmm. is is sort of gets to the net of something that even for someone like me, I've found that to be sort of sort of a, a mantra. You have to, you know, sort of move past the stuff that you can't control, which kind of brings me to the next question. Um, so this year and especially like in the last few months, a lot of people are experiencing pretty strong emotions or of, of, of fear, as you mentioned, where there is some doubt and there's some worry regarding their circumstances in this, well, let's call it the new political environment. Mm -hmm. So in your experience, what do you find is the catalyst for these emotions to develop into a what I would call them, or you might consider a serious disorder. And there are recognizable stages which you would take different approaches to the treatment mm. of that individual. 
Yeah. Yeah. First of all, I mean, the, the, the summary that you had of, you know, changing, you know, focusing on the things that you can change and, and letting go of the rest. I think that's a great encapsulation. I, I, people that I work with often do a great job of, of summarizing things in a very kind of pithy way. You know, it'll take me several paragraphs to say, maybe it's my academic past, but, <laughs> but I like those being able to, right. It's like to capture it, you know, imagine how hard it was for me to get it down to think act B. All right. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's such an important question about our our current political climate, and I, I think it'd be strange for someone not to feel some kind of unease about about where we find ourselves. I think, regardless of you know where we might be on the political spectrum, and and you know, because all the 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 ingredients are perfect for for having some kind of fear or anxiety about how things are going to go, because there are there are outcomes we care about. You know, we care about having having jobs for ourselves. We care about our kids having jobs. We care about having the freedoms that we want and all all kinds of things that our, our politics can influence. And there's uncertainty. And those those two things, outcomes we care about and uncertainty are, you know, that's fertile ground for for fear and anxiety to develop. And so I, I think what like with any with any conditions, what what takes something from from what we'd consider kind of run-of-the-mill anxiety or or worry or fear and turns it into a disorder is a couple things one is it's so uh, extreme that that the person finds it really really unpleasant or or even intolerable and it starts to get in the way of the person's life and so this uh, this idea of distress or impairment is built into any any diagnosis that we have, because we don't want to call something a disorder, you know, just because someone is is feeling upset or stressed or anxious or sad and so forth. And so there's, um, you know, by the time a person comes to see me, usually the um, the fear or depression or whatever it is has started to crowd out the things a person really cares about, and and has really driven the person to a point where they say, you know, something's got to change. Hmm. And and in terms of the the sequencing, I think that's a really um, important thing to think about, and that's where some of the art, a lot of the art, I think, comes in. Um, initially, I'd be more inclined to to begin, you know, if if, if there's really um, just a massive amount of fear, we would probably start with with some kind of exposure based approach. So you know, really working um, you know gently and gradually, and and you know, in a kind of programmed way to to help a person to move toward the things that are scary so those things become less scary over time and then once that grip that real grip has has started to loosen then we can move more toward a kind of acceptance and and mindfulness based approach where we say you know what i'm i'm i am going to feel anxious at times the life is filled with uncertainty can i live my life in a way that's true to what i value even in the middle of that uncertainty and anxiety all right well, that certainly takes us, uh, sort of dives right next into your mindfulness-based approach and, uh, and tackle what I'm sure many of our listeners may be experiencing internally or from others, basically, which is, uh, let's call it the emotion of hate. Um, mm. Walk us through your approach for dealing with this emotion and what may turn out to be you know, into, quite frankly, hostility toward others. And I think we're seeing some evidence of that today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Again, this is so timely. You know, there was a there was a great talk I heard recently by the psychologist uh, John Haidt, H-A-I-D-T. And he talked about this kind of tribal mentality that we have and how easy it is to divide the world up into for me and against me. So this, you know, this person or this group or this, um, this political party is for me and, and anyone who is, who is outside of that is, is against me. And I, I, and I think we all have had this experience of getting, getting triggered in some way and, and suddenly identifying the other person as the enemy, you know, even, um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's slightly embarrassing, but not, not, not so embarrassing <laughs> that I don't want to share it. That, you know, examples from, from my own life. I, uh, several months ago, I used to ride my bike to work a lot and, um, and most of the time it's fine, but occasionally you get someone who, who doesn't think, you know, a, a driver who doesn't think bikes should be on the road. So, so I'm almost to my office, you know, an office where I come to treat people for things, including anger and hostility. And, and, you know, I'm over, all the way over as far as I can be on the, on the side of the road and this car, you know, blows its horn as me at me as, as they go by, you know, shakes their hand at me. And, and, uh, and so instantly I see red and I take off 
and I, you know, I'm on my bike. <laughs> this is a car. I, I chase down this because I know there's a stoplight and it's it's going to be a long red. And so I chase the car down. What am I going to do when I get there? Like I know as this goes, I'm like, as soon as I take off, I'm thinking to myself, I should really let this go. <laughs> but it's like this tiny, tiny voice in the back of my head. I ignore it. I, I, you know, fly up after this car, and I so I end up right behind this car at the light, feeling satisfied that I caught up to it. But then, you know, what, what is there to do? I'm not going to, thankfully. <laughs> Thankfully, I, I uh, was not compelled to actually get into the into it with this driver, but it's so easy to imagine how how these things could end badly. So I think you know, in in that one kind of um, revealing example, there's there are there are many ingredients that will will tend to drive uh, anger and hostility. So so one is uh, is fear. I think fear is a big driver of anger. So you know, that initial honk, uh, you know, I'm I'm startled and my autonomic nervous system is activated that uh, that fight or flight response just that little that little startle and then you know the the follow up to that that little bit of fear is is anger i, I need to i need to attack the the source of that uh, you know ever caused that that fear response and so um and I also have this thought, like, that person should not have honked me. There's this this should. This person has mistreated me. This is unfair. I'm doing what I, what I should be doing. I, I have a right to be on the road. And I have this feeling, this is what's going through my mind at the time, very quickly. <laughs> so quick, I'm not even noticing these as thoughts. Just this sense of, of self-righteous injustice of the situation. So, um, And then those, those things, those emotions and, and thoughts then drove this behavior i'm going to track down this car and as i'm as i'm acting out my anger you know i'm probably working myself up to even more anger as my lungs are pumping and i'm feeling all the the blood coursing through my body so uh with this you know if we come back to think act b we have again three you know three tools where we can can intervene we can be aware of the, the thoughts that are might be driving the anger you know the shoulds maybe we can can let go of some of those those shoulds. Yeah, I'd like it if people don't honk at me, but it happens. And it doesn't mean I have to retaliate. In fact, it's probably better for all involved if I don't. Um, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, um, the actions, you know, again, if I can just take that pause, you know, that, that, um, just take a moment to recognize, you know, I, I have a choice here. I can, I can choose to let this go or I can choose to retaliate. And, and most of the time, there's going to be a benefit to de escalating a situation. Um, and then acceptance, you know, I, I, I think it's hard to overstate the value of acceptance when we're dealing with, with hostility and, and frustration. You know, I think, you know, acceptance with the, the political environment, for example, if, if, you know, someone wasn't a Donald Trump supporter and, you know, they wanted Hillary Clinton to win or somebody else and Donald Trump's going to be the president, there's a certain level of acceptance that can be helpful that, that as far as we know, he will be our president for at least the next four years. And what are we going to do? What kind of person do we want to be, given that, that, is, uh, that that's the reality? Um, in a similar way, you know, if we're dealing with someone who's difficult, I think you know, we probably all have difficult people in our lives. And it's so hard, at least for me, to let go of this idea that I need to make this person be not difficult. I need to somehow <laughs> change this person and fund that she's being difficult. I need to stop that. And it's probably not going to work, and it's only going to make things uh, again. It's going to escalate the situation. And when I'm when I'm fortunate, when I can actually step back and put a period at the end of that sentence and say, "This person is just difficult." Period. That's that's just how things are. There there can be a real freedom in that, a real freedom in stepping out of that feeling of I have to change this person and say like, "This is just who she is." And and that's that's how things are. It doesn't mean I like it. Acceptance doesn't mean I like things, but I'm but I'm willing to to let things be they are be the way they are if I can't change them. So I I think those those uh, those three things thinking, acting, and and you know this mindfulness based approach. I think they could all come in. They, I think it could be tailored to dealing with anything that's going on you know in our current our current political landscape. Well, and it's certainly you know what's manifesting as you saw that it's manifesting it self from individuals into real hostility to other people and it's yeah. and I don't know necessarily and and maybe in your experience you've seen this where if they're in a situation and they find themselves having emotions that are out of the ordinary or out of the norm for that individual I mean something mm -hmm. that you know becomes a very significant change in their mm -hmm. normal behavior, which ends up, 
you know, pushing them to do things they wouldn't necessarily do in other situations. Uh, you know, I, what do you find is that trigger? There, there must be something that, as you're as you're working through these things, you know, I think an individual that that is not predisposed to extremes in their activity or in their life, and then all of mm-hmm. a sudden something changes. What have yeah. you found is that there's a trigger somewhere, I would think. Yes, yes, there is. And, you know, I, I used this word before. It's a, it's a different it's a different variety. But, again, the sense of grip. I'm suddenly gripped by something. You know, if I'm on the road, I'm whether I'm driving or on a bike, I'm gripped with a sudden sense of, of anger or threat. And so I think a lot of a lot of the time what drives that grip is this feeling of of intense threat that my even my existence is threatened in a way we might call this kind of existential threat. Mm-hmm. So if I feel if I feel that that a political party's platform is maybe not platform but but some of the things that go along with a, a political candidate if I feel like those things are a threat to my very existence then I'm going to be likely to react in a way that's not that that's outside of how I usually react. You know, most of the time, thankfully, in this country, we don't have the sense of being under under threat of 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 harm or death. But if I feel like like that's threatened, then I may be uh, I'm going to be much more likely to react in ways that are that are severe, that are extreme, and that are probably in the moment going to feel justified. It, it's probably not going to feel so much like I'm aggressing as I'm. I'm playing defense. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think a, re- a related point is um, when I think about who we tend to hate, I, my, my idea, at least, is that we, we tend to hate people who bring out the worst in us. <laughs> okay. Not because, you know, not even so much a, because it's not so much that I'm reacting against the other person directly as I'm reacting to the way that they're, they're the, the reaction that they're evoking from me I, I think that we i think we tend to love the people that we love ourselves around i love the person who i am around this person and so i am drawn to that person and i think in the same way we want to destroy people who bring out a, a side of ourselves that we would much rather not see and so mm. i think that can lead to an, an escalation of, of hostility as both sides react to this version of themselves that they don't like to see and that they bl- blame the other person for drawing wow. out wow that's interesting Incredible. Well, let's move on to something else that you've um, spent a lot of time on. So for many individuals, our actions, their actions are a result of a strong emotion of desire. So you've got a significant amount of experience treating an obsessive compulsive disorder and addictions. Give our listeners your thoughts on the metamorphosis of normal desire into a disorder or an addiction and uh, what your treatment approaches are. You know, it's, it's really interesting to put those two together, addictions and obsessive compulsive disorder, because I you know, certainly a lot of people I've, I've treated who have OCD have described their strong, strong drive to do the compulsions as feeling like an addiction and as, you know, needing to, to, uh, to be completely abstinent from addictions, they can't give in because because one never satisfies. One one compulsive act never satisfies. So, um, and, and I think on the other side, I think people who are uh, addicted to a, a chemical substance often feel like they're like they're obsessed with it, or or feel again compelled to to engage in the behavior. So, so even though the um, the conditions, the diagnoses, kind of from a formal standpoint, are quite different, I think there is a, a similar underlying dynamic and in my view the the common thread in both of them is you know for most of the behaviors that we do there's you know if if we're not if we, if we don't have OCD or or we're not um, we don't have a substance use disorder there's a, there's some kind of there's a drive and then there's a behavior that satisfies that drive and so after we've engaged in the behavior we're less likely to engage in it so it's you know it's it's like a thermostat you know there's there's not enough heat the, the heater kicks on, room gets warmer, that makes the, the heater shut off. So there's a, you know, it's called a negative feedback loop. With OCD and with addictions, what we see is the opposite. We see a positive feedback loop. So the more I've done a behavior, the more likely I am to do that behavior. 
So, you know, with, with OCD, this, you know, a classic example would be something like, uh, I'm afraid that the stove is going to be left on and it's going to start a fire. I'm going to be responsible for that fire and, and you know, uh, the destruction, possible death that might result. And so I want to be absolutely sure that the, that the stove is turned off. And for, for someone who doesn't have OCD, we might have the, you know, similar thought, oh, my God, did I turn off the stove? We go check. It was off. We're satisfied. We walk away and, and probably don't give it another thought. In OCD, that checking the stove is then going to lead to more checking the stove. So I check the stove. All right. I get a little bit of a sense of relief, probably. I walk away. But then that doubt click, kicks in. How do I know that I turned the stove off? So I'm going to go back. I'm going to check. Okay, it's off. And I get that that relief, which the brain interprets as a reward. It interprets that It interprets the... Uh, confirming that there's uh, that no harm has has happened that the, that the danger is not present that that's interpreted as reward and so it makes that behavior more likely than the next time I have uh, the fear that maybe the stove is on or I mean, that's that's one example there OCD can be about anything anything that a person uh, is uh, is afraid might happen so that's just a a common example so with with addictions it's a similar type of process in that, you know, if, if someone drinks, um, say drinks alcohol, doesn't have a problem with it, then, you know, one drink, maybe two might satisfy the person says, that's it for me. I'm, I'm done. I, I, I don't want any more. At least I, I'm not, uh, I don't want it so much that I'm willing to, to have more and have a hangover or whatever. Uh, with addiction, the, the drive might be so strong that uh, the person doesn't resist that urge. And the more a person drinks, the more the person maybe might feel compelled to drink. So with with uh, with both of these with both of these um, with you know with treating both of these conditions, we need to cut off that that positive feedback loop. And uh, the way it's done for OCD is generally with a, a treatment called exposure and response prevention. So the idea is we need to have a person approach the types of things that bring up the obsessions that that trigger that fear, and then not engage in the compulsive behavior. So obviously it's easier said than done, like pretty much everything that I'm saying today. <laughs> and so the the real the challenge with CBT is is doing this in a in a, a gradual and a systematic way that um, that makes it manageable for the person to break down this this overall goal of cutting out um, the avoidance and cutting out the compulsions, um, and uh, and and doing it in a way that the person can um, can actually get some traction with. So with with addictions, what we would do, um, we, you know, I usually f- focus on in the kind of CBT that I do for, for treating substance use disorders is, you know, to identify things like the thoughts that are that are uh, sustaining, uh, you know, the drinking or, or drug use. So, for example, you know, it's it's amazing that the the mind, the power the mind has to lead us down roads that we've been down so many times before, and that didn't didn't lead us where we wanted them to go. And, and yet somehow it's, it's almost like we forget where they go. And so we'll tell ourselves things, you know, as, as, as addicts, we might say, I can have just one or, or I think I can handle it now. Or, you know, beer is not a problem for me. It's only hard alcohol. I'm fine if I just drink beer, even though 90 times out of 90, that behavior has led to the the person. I mean, having to see someone like me, it's it's led a person um, to addictions and uncontrolled drug use. So recognizing those thoughts, recognizing the kinds of lies that that the mind can tell us in order to to support you know continued drug use. And um, I mean, it's it's captured in this this AA um, idea of stinking thinking, kind of recognizing thoughts that don't serve us toward, uh, <laughs> in terms of addictions, yeah. and also really understanding the um, the the behaviors that um, that perpetuate using alcohol. So, you know, again, classic kind of uh, person, uh, people, places, and things type analysis. So, so recognizing, you know, all right, if I hang out with this person, there's there's probably a you know ninety percent chance that I'm going to use tonight. So maybe I should find someone else to spend time with, or maybe I should just stay home. Looking down the road, you know, and recognizing that these are some high-risk situations for me, and I'm going to have to have a plan going in. And so much of the work with addictions is is having that plan of having something in advance in place, so that when I when I reach that challenging point, I'm not surprised, I'm not caught off guard, and I can can respond the way that I want to. You know, there's this 
um, this idea of binding ourselves to the mast, you know, comes from from the Odyssey. This this notion that that when motivation is high, when I know right now that I'm 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 motivated to to avoid something that's bad for me in the future, and I know that in the future I'm I'm going to have low motivation to resist that thing. So I have to put something in place now that's going to make it really hard for me to to do that thing I don't want to do. So you know, an easy an easy example we can all probably relate to is you know not keeping cookies in the house if we're on a diet and don't want to eat the cookies <laughs> and if we say something like you know i just have to be strong enough i'm just gonna i just have to use willpower it's just you know mind over matter and and maybe we mean that but there is probably also a part of us that says and if i really want the cookies i want to have them close by i don't want to have to go out and get them so so there's probably some amb- ambivalence built into our you know if, if we are unwilling to to plan in advance in a way or you know, if I'm working with someone with addictions and we're talking about a high risk situation and I encourage the person, you know, let's, well, let's think about a plan for how to handle this. And the person says, you know, I'm just going to kind of see what happens, kind of, kind of let it, let it unfold organically. And, and, uh, and my job at that point is to think with the person about how that's gone in the past and about how, uh, how likely it is that just sort of letting things unfold is going to lead to a better outcome than it has every other time. Mm. So those are the main ways that I, that I treat OCD and, and substance use disorders. They're, uh, they're both, you know, very, um, challenging conditions, uh, challenging to have, obviously. I think the challenge that people around them tend to affect, um, family members and loved ones quite a lot. Um, and, uh, but, but also can respond very well to treatment when a person, you know, has, has a, a really compelling reason to, to give up those behaviors for new ones. Mm. Well, and that, you know, within that, what I wanted to do was maybe move into a little different nuance and uh, moving on to experiencing a full life. And what I'd like to ask is, how does love, the emotion of love, factor into your therapy with patients? Mm. Yeah, I'm, love really is at the at the core, I think, of any of the work that I do. I, I think it's why, I think it's why people come to treatment i think it's i think it's what can really fuel what can really fuel the work is so often when people come to me almost as a rule they've come because whatever they're dealing with has gotten in the way of of the 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 free flow of love in their lives in their in their relationships so you know if it's anxiety you know fear fear and anxiety and anger will will crowd out love and uh, you know, really push it to the margins of a person's life, and in the same way, depression can really uh, can really sap us of the ability to to express love or to certainly to feel love for ourselves, mm-hmm. um, and and our ability to love to love life, to love life itself, to enjoy the things that we do in life. And so, a lot of a lot of my work in the beginning is about you know working with a person to find out what. What brought them in? What is that they love? What is it that uh, that's going to fuel this work? Because it's going to be tough. I mean, why would someone come in and and you know if a person's already having a difficult time with things, where is a person going to find the the energy and the drive to to sustain the difficult work that we'll do together? And I think it always comes from from what a person loves. And so uh, you know, so we we. Whether we use the the word explicitly or not, I think we're um, we're really dealing with love mm-hmm. from the beginning, and you know, and just like just like uh, you know, a lot of certain strong emotions can crowd out love. I think love in a in a similar way can. There's this kind of reciprocal relationship where the more um, more we're able to experience love, I think the more that can can push back on our fear. And I I mean I just I have to say I I never get get tired of seeing uh, seeing someone go through this work and and use what the person loves to motivate himself or herself to to meet these challenges so seth let me ask you something i think our listeners would be interested can you share a couple of your let's call them your most memorable patient success stories they i think they'd love to hear that Mm. yeah I'm, i'm really happy to talk about those um there are there are many that that stay with me, and I it, w- one of the best things about this work is I get to be I get to be witness to you know a personal transformation 
that uh, that that I that I see. Yeah, a couple that that come to mind. One, this is a actually, you know, the the two that I'm thinking of, they're very very different, and and yet I think there are some some things that that might tie them together. The the first was um, was someone who had had gone through a, this this horrible trauma that 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 brought him to my office, and it had been a number of years before he had been shot. Uh, he wasn't. Um, it, it, it was an accident, but it was the the person was trying to shoot someone else, and he happened to get caught in the crossfire and 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 lost the use of his right arm. I, I've written about this this elsewhere, um, but but couldn't use his right arm anymore, and and uh, was right handed, of course, and so it was a you know a daily reminder, um, you know, a constant reminder of the shooting, and and so this person had had horrible post traumatic stress disorder. Um, felt really, really isolated and, and down on himself for still feeling bad. And, and of course, you know, understandably, it's so much anger and resentment for, uh, you know, toward this person who had shot him. And, and so, you know, we did uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for PTSD. And, um, and, you know, after a few sessions, this, this person said, you know, I, I, I really want to, I want to be able to forgive the, the guy who shot me, but I'm just not there, man. And, and he felt bad that he wasn't able to. And, and so we talked about how there's a time, there's a time for everything. He was very, uh, he's very religious. And he, um, you know, we talked about this, this verse, uh, you know, time for everything, a time to uh, kill, a time to heal and, and so forth. And, and, and including a time to hate. And he was able to, um, to give himself permission in a way to to feel hatred for this person who mm-hmm. had had taken the the use of his of his right arm and and then over time as as his you know he had he had so much fear he felt so unsafe uh, just just going outside um and as he was able to to uh, to feel less afraid and to get back to his life that grip of the anger and the hatred loosened and i was i was blown away by by where he went with it, so you know, again, I, I say I'm witness to this work. This is not, this is not something I was encouraging him to do, or even knew that he was doing. But mm-hmm. he ended up going to to visit his the guy who had shot him in uh, in prison, oh. and talked to the person. And I know I, I was so moved when he told me this. I had to kind of keep it together in <laughs> in the session, and ended up having compassion for this person, and found out that he had a young son who. Uh, he would never see. I mean, he was. I think he was sentenced to 25 years mm-hmm. in prison, and so he would never, you know, actually get to um, to be a dad to his to his young son. And so the the person I was working with ended up, and this really took it to the next level for me. But weeks later, he, um, I think it was after our treatment had ended, he came back and he told me that he was working um, on on trying to get the person released early from prison so that he could. Uh, I could be with his son, and wow. so uh, it just yeah, blew my mind. Just the, uh, yeah, the the power of. I mean, first of all, the acceptance of it. It took going through that hatred, allowing himself to to feel it and to have it, and then in, in order to to transcend it. And you know, I, I don't offer this as an example. This is what everyone who's who is uh, you know who's gone through something like this should do, or that um, you know, so about being prescriptive about, about forgiveness, that this is, um, you know, everyone has to do this to, to get better. It's very personal, but, but in his case, it was really just remarkable the, how, how, again, the, the, as his fear went down and in his case, you know, the, the love, um, really, really replaced it in, in these dramatic ways in his life. And then, um, you know, in a very, um, very different way. Another person I worked with a number of years ago, you know, when she came to me, this was a, a young woman. She had had a number of ways that she had, she felt like she had disappointed herself in her life. She didn't feel like she had, um, had lived up to her potential. She had been the person that she wanted to be. And, and she, she really felt broken in many ways. She felt, uh, she felt inadequate. She felt like a disappointment in a, in a global way. She felt, um, she felt like she she wasn't worthwhile. She had very, very little worth, and and really didn't like herself. And she did an, an incredible incredible amount of work. It was so much took so much work on her part to keep going and to continue to push through this um, this sense of of not being enough, um, the sense that she had about herself. And again, the just just watching someone take the things that we work on together and really develop them 
on her own. And um, she, she started to um, develop this way of, of seeing herself where she actually could feel love for herself. She could actually feel like she was worthwhile, like she had worth and she could reconnect to the strength that she had felt before. And honestly, I think the strength that, uh, that brought her to my office, that strength that was always there, that, that didn't allow her to give up. And so, you know, after many, many months of work, she, um, she really seemed like, in, in many ways, a different person. I think she had gotten back to a sense, really, of respecting herself and of of caring for herself. You know, of living each day in a way as though, you know, treating herself as though she was someone that she cared about. Which she ended up, uh, or, you know, started um, had to start with kind of faking, pretending like she was someone that she cared about, <laughs> and then right. over time, begin to to actually feel feel that she was someone who was worth caring about is worth loving. And, and she was able to give up some uh, relationships in her life that really weren't, uh, weren't serving her well at all. Mm-hmm. I think relationships that played to that sense of, of not being enough and of being, of be you know, of not being someone worth, worth really caring about. Mm-hmm. So those two, I guess, I guess what, um, what stands out to me for, for both of them is just the love that, that drove the work again, coming back to love that it was, you know, one, one guy who, who was able to um, to use love in this powerful way to um, to to forgive and to um, possibly change you know change another person's life in a positive way, even though that person had changed his life in a very dark way, and this other this young woman who was able to to really uh, rediscover a love and a care for herself in a way that that allowed her to um, get back to the person that she wanted to be. Those are amazing stories. Thank you for sharing those. All right. Yes, my pleasure. Now, we do have a, a question from one of our listeners, and this gets back to some more fundamentals uh, based on what uh, this person's asking. So, Beth, who is 24 years old and from the Boston area, and she's a student at UMass, and what she writes is, uh, her question is, there are days when the pressure of school, keeping my job, and trying to maintain a relationship causes me to feel a deep hopelessness, her words, hopelessness, in my ability to make it all work. I often truly dread the sun coming up. How do I get out of this emotional state so that it does not become something worse? Mm. Yeah, I appreciate the question from Beth. Uh, you know, the, I, mean, I, I, can't, uh, I can't make um, you know, specific recommendations for an individual, but I think there are the, the things that, that Beth describes, unfortunately, I think are so are so common for for what people uh, are experiencing, and uh, so you know. So I go back to to this think act be idea, um, and the I would start with with act with uh, you know in, in a situation like this I would I would probably um, you know I think with the person if there are any adjustments that she might make to um, you know to bring more enjoyment into life. You know it sounds like for Beth at least it sounds like it's kind of all all work uh, no fun. So um, I would be inclined to start with you. Know, are there, are there even you know small changes that she could make in order to bring more of a of a sense a sense of of play and and fun and, and uh, enjoyment into her life? You know, it could even be very simple things. Wouldn't have to take a lot of time, which it sounds like is in a very short supply in her life. Um, but it could be things like um, like listening to some favorite music in the car or um, you know things that wouldn't wouldn't cost her much in terms of her time it might mean cutting out some things that aren't very rewarding too maybe she's uh doing things that aren't very um aren't aren't recharging her batteries when she has the opportunity um, so we could think about those things as well the um, you know thinking i'd want to uh, you know some of what she described sounds sounds like there's probably a lot of of worrying going on a lot of persistent worry and uh and worry can be kind of kind of um self self perpetuating in a way so that um you know i i worry because i worried and and nothing nothing bad happened when i worried and so in a way the brain might learn that by worrying i can prevent bad things from happening even though in in reality there's there's very little connection there and so I'd want to, you know, think with with a person about, you know, how how useful is worry in her life, and would it be helpful to uh, to worry less, to to start training the mind to to do something else rather than than worrying all the time. And and I think that would lead right into the the B part of this approach. So 
uh, you know, one of the most helpful ways of dealing with with uh, with worry in particular is training the mind to direct its attention away from away from itself, I guess, and um, and into into reality. So so noticing when my mind is going into to worries. Worries are are always about the future by definition. They're about something that's that's uncertain and that's not now. And so I can notice when that's happening, and I can can with practice bring my attention back to the present, back to whatever is going on now. Maybe it's having a conversation, maybe it's um, doing the dishes, maybe it's exercising, but whatever it is, training the mind to be engaged in the present moment. And most likely what's going to happen is the mind's going to drift back to the worry. And so um, the practice is really just that. It's a practice of coming back over and over and stepping out of that that constant um, worry, worry, worry cycle and, and more into um, to a place of, of being, of being in the present and also honestly, uh, practicing acceptance of that uncertainty that I can't control. Mm -hmm. And we can, thankfully over time, we can, um, we can become more comfortable and more, more tolerant of uncertainty, more willing for things to be uncertain. So, uh, let me ask you something as we, uh, begin to, uh, wrap up our conversation a little bit. So for those that want to see or hear more from you, are there any upcoming speaking engagements or articles you're going to publish that you would like our listeners to be aware of? Mm, yeah, I appreciate that. The, probably the best place to, uh, to go is just to my website, sethgillahan.com. And um, you know, I have a number of, a number of resources there. So I, I post regularly on my Think, Act, Be blog uh, on that website. I also have links there to my, my blog on the psychologytoday.com website. There are a number of guided meditations that I offer there uh, that, are, that are available for free to download uh, that I'll be adding to regularly. So I think that's the, the best place to start. Terrific. Well, Seth, I'll tell you, it's been a real pleasure being able to speak with you and learning about your mindfulness approach for experiencing life to the fullest. You can find more information about Seth at his practice website, sethgillian.com. That's S-E-T-H-G-I-L-L-I-H-A-N.com. And join me next time for another episode of Emotions Matter.